Hi, good afternoon. I am Colonel Jim Pesha. I'm the Director for Budget Operations and Personnel here in the, in the Pentagon. And I've been asked to give you a quick 20 to 25 minute briefing on where we stand with the 2015 budget, especially when it uh, is, or I'm sorry, in particular to the O&M appropriation. But before I get started, I've also been asked to announce that if you're expecting to see Mr. Jeff Sherman, who is supposed to brief around 1130, um, he is actually going to brief at 1.30 this afternoon, so you can expect to see him at that time. So uh, next slide, please. We'll go ahead and get started. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, just a quick update from D.C. and where we stand with FY15 and a little bit on FY16. Go over the FY15 budget, some FY15 bills, which really kind of tells where we're headed for this fiscal year. A few CE interest items, and then uh, we don't have time for questions this afternoon. So next slide, please. So for DC, um, if you're like me, you're wondering where we are on the Hill, what's going on with FY15, and then a little bit about where we're headed for the FY16 president's budget. So as you know, the continuing resolution is set to expire on 11 December. And right now Congress is working um, feverishly to come up with an appropriation bill of some sort, talking with uh, Colonel Sam Grable, who is our budget liaison officer here in DC, um, when he talks to the folks on the Hill, uh, what they're not telling them is they're really focused on extending the continuing resolution. What they're telling them is they're actually trying to get some sort of an appropriation bill established prior to that 11 December cutoff, which is certainly good news and certainly what we want to hear. So there are three options for the Hill. The first one is the continuing resolution extension. And we can extend on the short term anywhere from uh, February to March, the continuing resolution could be a long-term resolution all the way through the fiscal year. Uh, that's not something we've seen very often, certainly not on the defense side, and we don't expect to see it this time. But there is an option for an, another continuing resolution. The second option is an omnibus, which would act as an appropriation bill for not only defense, but also the rest of the government. That's what we want to see. We always want to see an appropriation bill that gives us some sort of stability. It lets us know where our funding is and it lets us go out there and execute our funding in a timely manner. So that's certainly what we want to see um, from Congress within the next eight days or so. There's also something that you've probably heard or read about in the newspaper. It's called the Cromnibus. And that's really kind of a combination of a continuing resolution and an omnibus. And what the Hill is, is looking at, especially tor or the GOP, is a continuing resolution for certain programs and an omnibus for others. So those related to immigration, um, Homeland Security, for example, they would look at for a continuing resolution for an extended period of time. Again, either a short-term or long-term continuing resolution. And then for Department of Defense and the rest of the government, they would look at an omnibus bill or an omnibus appropriation. So those are really the only three options that are on the table right now and being discussed. Someone asked a question before I came down is whether or not a government shutdown is on the table as an option like it was last year. Nowhere in any discussion from any of the committees on the Hill is a government shutdown being considered or talked about. So we've pretty much written that one off for this fiscal year, which is great. So again, we're hoping for an omnibus bill, but if that doesn't work out, if that becomes a bridge too far between now and the 11th of December, then a continuing resolution is what we expect to see. And again, that decision will be made before 11 December. Before I came down, we got word that the authorizers the House Armed Services Committee and Senate Armed Services Committee have agreed upon a National Defense Authorization Act. They have conferenced and come to terms on what they want to pursue for FY15 for an NDAA. So that's good news. That's actually expected to go to the House floor tomorrow for a vote. And hopefully we will then see the appropriation committees early next week, perhaps Monday or Tuesday, go to the floor with their own appropriation bill so we can have some sort of an omnibus passed prior to that 11 December deadline. So we're hopeful to see a bill, but if not, we would expect to see a continuing resolution for FY15 to get us to the next step. For FY16, the program budget review is certainly in full swing. We've been working that for the last couple of months with OSD, Comptroller, and CAPE. 
Uh, we've had a few resource management decisions handed down so far. Um, so far on the O&M side, we have not seen anything that I would call too dramatic. Certainly no major reductions, no major programmatic changes or shifts um, from an FY14 position. So they've been pretty benign so far. They're not quite finished yet. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll stay on the same path that we are right now. Uh, some of the other appropriations have been a little bit more volatile as you would expect, um, but we're not gonna hit on too many of those today. The database is expected to lock either at the end of December or really the first part, maybe the first week in January. Um, that will be good to get that done early so we can start writing those justification books. And then the program budget is due to be submitted um, to Congress on that first Monday in February, which is the 2nd of February this year. And then we'll start the rollout briefs, the staffer briefings on the Hill, et cetera, to go explain where we are in FY16 and what the strategy is for the United States Air Force. The hot topic, of course, for 16 is the sequester. Will we be funded at a sequestered level or not? The Bipartisan Budget Act, again, gave us some relief in FY14 and FY15. Um, for the United States government, it was about $45 billion in relief for 14 and about $18.5 billion for 15. But it didn't do anything for 16 and out. And so we don't know exactly where we're going to be. Are we going to be at a president's budget level? Are we going to be at a sequestered level? Will we be somewhere in between? Will there be another bipartisan budget act that gets passed? to put is somewhere in between, will we be above the PB level? We don't really know. We've programmed to the president's budget level, and that's where we are right now, and that's certainly what we will submit to the Hill. And then once it's over to the Hill, then we'll have to start the negotiation phase to figure out where we're actually going to be funded in 16. So there are a lot of unknowns out there right now, um, and whatever that decision is will certainly have an impact on what the strategy is for the Air Force and how our programs are funded in FY16. So lots, lots to go yet for FY16. Next slide, please. So this chart kind of gives a feel. If you look on the top part of the chart, you'll see a red line at the very bottom. And that represents the sequestered level for really FY16 and out. And so the line right above that is the president's budget level. And so you can see where the FY16 line, the red line, and where the blue line at the PB level are, that's about a $9 billion swing. And so when we talk about the importance of the sequester and where that may put us, that gap, that $9 billion gap, will drive a lot of changes or could potentially drive a lot of changes in the budget. So again, we would like to see our budget at the PB level, perhaps a little bit higher, but a, a lot has, has yet to happen and unfold, so we don't know where we're going to be. But in 15, the red line down below shows where the sequester was, and there's a little orange or yellowish orange line above that, which is that uh, Bipartisan Budget Act level, which is where we're funded for FY15 right now. But to get there and not to go to the PB level where we wanted, we had to make some choices. And what the chief decided to do is to trade off some capacity for capability. And readiness had been impacted with the sequester in FY13. It had been impacted in FY14. And so we needed to fix readiness and to make readiness as, as whole as we possibly could. And so many of the decisions were to make sure that those warfighters that go overseas into the AR were capable, they were equipped, and they were ready to go. And so there were some trade-offs in that. Um, for a lot of force structure changes were, uh, were decided from the Air Force. For example, uh, the A-10, which you probably hear most about, we decided to divest of the A-10. Now, Congress may change our mind on that, and so we'll adjust when the appropriation bill comes out, whatever Congress decides. But um, in that lower left-hand box, there are several items that are listed below, and that really talks about some of the trade-offs and some of the, the hard choices, strategic choices we had to make to protect that readiness and to make sure that the forces that we have that go overseas are as capable as they possibly can be. And now there are some discussions about the capacity. Do we need, the more, or need more capacity with everything else that's gone in the world? And certainly that's part of the strategy and what we want to talk about to Congress when we get to FY16. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see the sequestered levels and what would have to go away 
if we are sequestered. And so those things are very similar to FY15 and FY16 with probably a few more in FY16. So next chart. So I'll, I'll kind of dive down into the FY15 piece more specifically. On the left-hand side, you'll see comparison between the FY14 enacted and the FY15 piece. Um, when you look at that, they look relatively flat. And pretty much for the most part, they are. Since we're specifically looking at the O&M piece, I'll just focus you down to the bottom two boxes. It shows in 14 is about $42.2 billion and it's about 44.3 or so in FY15. And actually in FY14, it was almost 45 billion. What Congress had done is they took 2.8 billion out of our baseline O&M program and they put it into our OCO program and that was to get underneath the Budget Control Act or our budget caps. And so our program was really about 45 billion. If we can go to the next slide, We'll break that down a little bit farther on the O&M side. So up on the top, it talks the flying hour program where there's about a $300 million increase and that's flying hours and it's also weapon system sustainment. When you look down below, it's civilian pay. It's right about the same. It's a little bit less. Again, our O&M top line went down a little bit in, in 15, vice 14. So civ pay also went down a little bit. But the corporate structure also took a little bit of financial risk because of hiring freezes, because of sequestration in 13 and 14, we had not executed our civilian pay program as well as we'd like. So some money was taken out of that to help fund readiness in the flying hour uh, portion. Right below that, you'll see a combat forces um, slot. And again, that was plus of about $300 million. And that's the other half of readiness for the United States Air Force. And then down below, you'll see the sustainment piece, which you're probably more familiar with. And there was also a decrease there of about $600 million. And then down below, all the other programs took a decrease. And again, that was to make sure our readiness was funded in FY15 um, to the capacity and the capability that we require. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, for uh, OCO. The uh, FY14 and FY15 OCO pieces are very similar. Um, they're almost identical. FY14 was about $8.5 billion on the O&M side, and for the FY15 piece, we're about $8.3 billion. Now, we've already gone in with an amendment, an ISIL amendment in FY15, um, and so that added about another $900 million or so to our PB request. And we've also done the FY16 piece for OCO, and that will be submitted with the president's budget. Uh, we expect to do another ISIL amendment at some point in FY16, but we're not quite there yet. Um, also, what's new in FY16 and potentially 15, there are two programs. One's the Counterterrorism Partnership Fund, which is a terrorism-like fund where we can submit requirements to, and there's also a European Reassurance Initiative Fund that we can also potentially push requirements into. Those are, uh, we would compete requirements through OSD with the other services, but there are other avenues out there um, in the OCO realm in FY15 and FY16 that did not exist in FY14. So overall, if you were looking at OCO programs and wondering if OCO is going away, the answer is no, it's not going away, not anytime soon. It's still there. It's still very similar to what we've executed in the past. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so for our O&M bills, and this is really what's driving our strategy at this point for FY15. And like all of you, we have bills up here at the Air Staff. And certainly when I look at my portfolio on the O&M side, um, as I start FY15, I have about $2.7 billion in bills that I'm looking at. And so $2 billion of those are what I would call normal bills that we look at at the beginning of every fiscal year. And those are bills that could not be programmed um, from the POM perspective because there just wasn't enough top line. And those are things like the COCOM taskings, the long haul communications, presidential airlift, the theater security packages, uh, some flag exercises. And those are good examples of, of programs that just don't get top line during a POM process, but still have to be paid. And the other 700 million are potential congressional 
casts or marks. And we don't expect to see um, a whole lot in congressional marks. We certainly don't expect to see a $700 million cut, but we need to be prepared for it. And so we have set aside some funds to cover that. And the funds, as you all know, is execution reserve account, where we tax the major commands at distribution to help pay for some of those bills. And the ERA this year was about $1.2 billion. And so you compare that to my $2 billion in bills plus a potential $700 million in congressional marks. And we're still short by about a billion and a half. And what that doesn't cover is another $1.3 billion worth of bills that the major commands have come in asking for relief. And so starting the fiscal year, um, certainly there's a challenge. And this is really not something that I would consider new for us. This is something that's pretty pretty static. Uh, last year, the bills starting the fiscal year were right about $2.2 2 billion. There was a little bit more taken in the ERA last year than this fiscal year. Um, but you know we're in the same place that we've been in the past. And, and the point really is to our major commands and to our wings out there is, is now is not the time to panic. We're still early in the fiscal year. We don't have a budget yet. There seems to be um, some willingness from the congressional side to help us with our shortfalls, to help us with readiness, to help us get where we need to go, especially with the way things are changing in the world right now. A lot of things are unfolding that we didn't expect. We need to be more flexible. We need to be able to answer the nation's call. And so Congress seems to be a little bit more willing to help with some of those requirements. And so whether we get help um, during the appropriation bill process, either in reduced congressional marks or perhaps some additional dollars for programs, or whether we see help later on in the fiscal year through another omnibus reprogramming or some type of reprogramming to cover our bills is yet to be seen. But there seems to be some willingness to help um, to get to enable us to get done what we need to get done. So, so don't worry about this part. You know, I, I don't lose too much sleep over this. Two billion dollars is is a substantial amount of money for bills and for us to work through at the air staff. But we've done this this in the past, and we'll continue to do that in the future. So, if we can get the next chart, please. So, some CE interest items. Um, a lot of the folks I know out there are civil engineering members. Um, and I know we ask a lot out of our civil engineers, especially help in funding other programs when we start the fiscal year. And I know that's a burden. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, either at a MAGCOM level, at a base level, an air staff level. So I understand the importance of the flexibility in using some of your dollars to get us through the fiscal of the year early and so we can also then work to pay you back later. Um, so thank you for that, first of all. And But when we look in the FY14 and we look at the sustainment money that was funded, it was about 70% of what your requirements were. Now, um, by the end of the year, we are able to add around $900 million or so to take care of some of those requirements, especially our project funding. When we look at 15, the sustainment budget was funded right about 65%, which is a little bit less than, than uh, last fiscal year. And we don't know yet for sure how much we're going to be able to help you at the end of the fiscal year. Right now, there is a congressional limitation that's out there, so we need to meet that. And certainly, we will meet that. But we need to continue to partner with you from the FM side to you on the CE side to make it through some of our fiscal challenges. Um, you know, you do provide that stability up front for those who perform um, the mission for us, uh, you know, the readiness piece. Our flying hour program needs to be funded up front so they can go out and plan and execute those flying hours and can, can uh, train the air crew the way they need to be trained. We need to be able to fund the weapon system sustainment piece up front. So they also can plan and the depots can plan and know what parts to order, what aircraft are going to come through, so they can build their program early. But unfortunately, that comes at sometimes the expense of the civil engineering pot and the FSRM part in particular. 
So we understand that. I, I can tell you from where I sit, I understand that. Again, from my past, um, also as a, a past mission support group commander who own the civil engineers, I certainly have an understanding of what CE folks do and the importance of what you do for the rest of us. So we will continue to partner as we move through this fiscal year. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that as well. And also, um, we're working on the Hill to potentially eliminate the funding limitation that's on the SR, FSRM program. And that's really to enable us to have some flexibility. As our top line continues to go down, what we also need to have then is flexibility in the dollars that we have left to execute. Right now, 70%, almost 71% of our dollars are either mandated in terms of pay or they have a limitation and that other 30 percent just doesn't get us where we need to go and so we're working with congress to reduce some of those limitations certainly on your side as well as some other areas now i know miss gleason came and talked to you earlier on the air force uh, or af ims imsc um, and so i'm not going to go into a whole bunch of that but you know even though there's some challenges in that in the stand-up of the imsc there's also some opportunity, especially from our engineering side. Um, a lot of dollars will ultimately go toward the IMSC at the end of the fiscal year to look for projects throughout the Air Force. And the IMSC will be in a perfect position to figure out where that next scarce dollar will go, to, at least to meet the Air Force priorities. And so what I ask you is, as you move into that transition and you take on that challenge, is to keep in the mind that not only is it difficult to stand something up like this, but there's also tremendous opportunity out there for you guys to do good things and to make sure our scarce dollars go where they need to go. So next slide, please. Okay, so we're not gonna do questions, but really as a summary, um, I would just add that number one, now is not the time to panic. We will make it through this fiscal year just like we have every other year. We have some challenges to work through, but we're gonna work through those challenges challenges. It's not a doom and gloom year. I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I, I never have been. Um, and so FY15 is not what I would call a doom and gloom year, just like FY14 wasn't. Um, both years were better than FY13. I think we'll all agree. And I think by the time we end FY15, we'll probably be somewhat better than FY14. And we'll continue to work the FY16 piece to continue to improve our position. And the last thing I'm going to just ask uh, is to be ready. Always be ready to spend those dollars when we have those dollars. And that's it all, all that I have. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.